Hey you guys, welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you are new. My name is Elena, and a lot of the time on my channel I like to talk about creepy stuff. Today's video is going to be about the Salem Witch Trials. Now, I'm sure we've all heard about the Salem Witch Trials in history class in school, or maybe we had to read The Crucible in English class. I've personally always found the Salem Witch Trials to be such an interesting topic. I mean, I've always kind of been into like dark and twisted things, but it always fascinated me, the psychology behind all of this. It's just so confusing, and that interest that has been ingrained in me for like over 10 years just has not left. These witch trials began in the year 1692, so literally over 325 years ago. Much more so than today, people believed in the supernatural. Thoughts of demons, the devil being possessed, ghosts, spirits, all of that was thought of as fact. And one of society back then's big fears was the power of the devil, giving humans the power to manipulate, harm, or kill others. And this was what they thought of a witch to be. A witch would be someone who was given power by the devil. This fear of witches was so strong that witches were even killed for being witches with no real hard evidence. So in the early months of the year 1692, a small group of girls in the village of Salem, Massachusetts all claimed that they had been possessed by the devil and accused a few local women of being witches and being the ones who possessed them. And it's interesting to know that in the beginning only women seemed to be accused but throughout the witch trials and throughout the year of 1692, a lot of men were also accused. So once these girls made these claims, everyone completely took their word for it and hysteria literally spread like wildfire throughout Massachusetts. Everyone was totally on edge. No one knew if their family members, friends, neighbors were witches, secretly practicing witchcraft. Throughout the year of 1692, over 200 people were formally accused of witchcraft in Massachusetts. Over 150 were arrested and dozens received guilty verdicts in court cases of being witches. Those that were said to be guilty were normally sent to the witch jail, which was a whole separate dungeon that was usually known to be wet, dark, and cold, and also infested with water rats. And a lot of these convicts accused of witchcraft were actually randomly told to strip down and were humiliated. You know, they already were super humiliated by being convicted as witches, but they're being even further humiliated by like the dungeon guards telling them to strip down and doing physical examinations of their bodies. I couldn't figure out why they did this. I don't know if it was some weird power thing or if it was a sexual thing. I couldn't really figure that out. It just sounds like a load of creepy shit to me. 24 innocent people ended up being hanged for their involvement in witchcraft. And two dogs were even killed for acting suspiciously during the times of these trials, which is so sad. I know I'm like more sad about the dogs than the humans, but like, come on, that's really sad. But interestingly enough, by the end of that year, the hysteria was dwindling and it was pretty much gone. And people started to think that these witch trials were super extra and ridiculous. And a lot of the people who were convicted as guilty witches actually had their verdicts overturned by the local judicial system, but nothing could be done about all of those that were put to death for their supposed involvement with witchcraft. So that was just kind of a general rundown of the witch trials. I would like to get into a little more detail with you guys to tell you more about the witch trials. So the first two girls to accuse other people of witchcraft were Elizabeth Paris, who was nine years old, and her 11-year-old cousin, Abigail Williams. So they started to have these like fits of violent outbursts. They would be screaming seemingly uncontrollably. Their bodies would contort in weird ways. They would be flailing their arms and their legs. And just think of, you know, horror movie when someone is possessed. That was basically how these girls were acting. So a local doctor was actually called over and, well not called, but you know what I mean. And after looking at them, he formally diagnosed them with bewitchment. Could you imagine that as a diagnosis today? After this diagnosis, a ton of girls in the local Salem area started to exhibit very similar symptoms as Elizabeth Paris and Abigail Williams, so it started to be kind of like an epidemic of sorts. The other girls who made these accusations names were Elizabeth Hubbard, Mercy Lewis, Mary Walcott, Mary Warren, and Anne Putnam Jr. These girls were then questioned by authorities and then they placed the blame for their bewitchment on three different women. The first was actually Elizabeth Paris's family's slave. She was from the Caribbean and her name was Tijba. One was a local homeless woman named Sarah Good. 
and the last one was a very poor and elderly woman named Sarah Osborne. Obviously today we can look back and know pretty much for certain that these three women had nothing to do with bewitching these young girls, but unfortunately people took the young girl's word for it and not these grown women. All three of these women, Tituba, Sarah, and Sarah, were all brought to court, and during their court proceedings all of these seven girls were sitting in the courthouse screaming and having these violent outbursts and these fits. Both Sarah's were completely adamant that they had nothing to do with this and that they were completely innocent, but Tituba actually admitted and confessed to serving the devil. And she probably did this because she feared if she pled innocent that the punishment would be worse than if she pled guilty. So Tituba also said that it wasn't just her practicing witchcraft, there were several other women in the community who she was practicing witchcraft with. So this statement from Tituba, along with all of the hysteria that was already going around, played into this guilty until proven innocent, which you couldn't really even prove someone innocent, mindset that these villagers had. Not all this hysteria was centered in Salem. As I said, a lot of it was throughout Massachusetts. Other communities in the state got wind of this and started to have their own bouts of hysteria and a ton of people coming forward claiming to be bewitched by certain people. And some of these young women who came forward and who were accusing certain people of bewitching them actually had not met any of the people that they were accusing. Sometimes these people lived in towns over that they had literally never met. There was even one town named Andover, which was about 15 miles away from Salem, and think about how far 15 miles was back in 1692. I mean, it's obviously the same distance as today, but you can't just get in a car and drive 15 miles. Andover was severely affected by all of this hysteria. Through the process, a lot of people who lived in the area admitted to signing packs with the devil, probably because of the same reason that Tituba claimed she signed a pact with the devil to try to get a lesser punishment for admitting to it, since there was literally no way to prove that you were innocent. This town of Andover, at the height of its hysteria, had one in 10 people accused of being a witch. So literally one in 10 of its residents were going through some sort of trial for being a witch. In this town, there was actually a very good Christian man who was a sea captain and actually was part of the family that founded Plymouth, Massachusetts. So he was very affluent and well-respected. And he actually asked when he was accused, why would I bother to enchant people I neither knew of nor had ever met? It's a really good point. Bro raised a good point, but unfortunately the court didn't take this seriously, even though a lot of the people on his specific court knew him super well. I mean, think about how small these communities were. A lot of these people went to church with him, did business with him, were friends or family or family friends, and they still convicted him of being a witch. During this hysteria, there was even a very well-respected minister named Cotton Mather, who warned the community about spectral evidence and how it couldn't really prove much. And by spectral evidence, he means that, you know, a lot of people were coming forward saying that they had visions or dreams in which they saw, you know, someone that lived in their village practicing witchcraft and that was literally enough to get someone killed. And Cotton's father, who was named Increase, who was also a very highly respected member of the community, also urged villagers to hold these accusations of witchcraft to the same standard as other crimes. And he was quoted saying, it would be better that 10 suspected witches may escape than one innocent person be condemned. But unfortunately, no one really listened to Increase in Cotton Mather and the hysteria continued. So as I already said, some of these people were very upstanding members of the community that were being accused of being witches. And at one point, there was even a four-year-old girl who was accused of being a witch. The first ever conviction in the Salem witch trials occurred about five months after the hysteria first began. A woman named Bridget Bishop was convicted on June 2nd and then hung on June 10th at Gallows Hill. That next month in July, five more people were hanged and their names were Sarah Good, Rebecca Nurse, Susanna Martin, Elizabeth Howe, and Sarah Wilds. And they died along with another five who were hung in August. Martha Carrier, John Willard, Reverend George Burroughs, George Jacobs Sr., and John Proctor. If you read The Crucible in school, you probably recognize some of these names. And unfortunately, in September, a whopping eight villagers were hanged. They were Mary Eastie, Martha Corey, Anne Pudeter, Samuel Wardwell, Mary Parker, Alice Parker, Wilmot Red, and Margaret Scott. 
And all of these deaths are not to mention the other four who actually died in the witch's jail, which I already told you guys about. The conditions were horrible. Their names were Lydia Dustin, Ann Foster, Sarah Foster, and Roger Toothaker. And the last death that occurred because of these witch trials was that of Giles Corey, and he was a poor elderly man who was in court for these witch trials, and he refused to plead guilty or innocent, so he was publicly stoned to death. And this was done so in such a brutal way. He was literally laid down like on some boards and people pressed these huge stones on him until he died. And unfortunately, none of these people that were killed were provided with proper burials. This was since they were thought to be colluders with the devil. And since, you know, these areas were super Christian back then, the thought of colluding with the devil was like the worst thing ever. And the only way that they buried people back then in these communities was through Christian rituals. And so why would they give someone a Christian ritual if they were colluding with the devil? These people were unfortunately just thrown into shallow graves and some dirt was thrown on top of them. I found it interesting that a lot of people assume that these witches were burned at the stake. That was actually something that happened in the European witch trials, but not the American witch trials. The executions during the American witch trials were all done by hanging besides Giles Corey who was stoned to death. But these European witch trials were completely different. In France, they burned witches at the stake, but in England, they actually hung witches, like in America. Luckily, and I say that with a heavy heart, but luckily, after September, nobody else was hanged. It's just absolutely crazy to me how the hysteria blew up so big, and over 200 people were accused of being witches, and then over 150 convicted of being witches, and then, you know, so many hanged, all for the hysteria to dwindle down just as fast as it built up. By May of the next year, 1693, the governor of Massachusetts officially released and pardoned all accused witches who were still serving time in prison and it blows my mind that it took that long to pardon people from September until May that's a long time and fast forward to January of 1697 the state of Massachusetts actually declared a day of fasting to honor those who passed away in the Salem witch trials and that is about it I hope you guys enjoyed learning a little more about the Salem witch trials and if this is something that interests you give me a thumbs up or leave a comment down below I'd really like to know. Thanks for watching. I love you and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.